Thank you very much to Kurt and all the organizers of this conference. I'm delighted to be in St. Andrews, albeit only virtually, unfortunately. Uh, better luck next time. So, as Matea said, uh, my the title of my presentation is uh, Beyond the Geopolitical Chessboard Paradigm, Self-Serving Narratives and Corrosive Capital in the Balkans, which suggests two components to, to my presentation. Um, in reality, I will try to fit in three components. So first, the material component, so this uh, issue of the economic, of the political economy, of the corrosive capital and the uh, sultanism that is the reason why Kurt called me to be on this panel, probably. Um, the second one is this narrative component, so how this uh, interaction between local players and, uh, um, and external actors is used for political ends in the Balkans. And third, I will introduce a pandemic component, uh, presenting uh, some very new data on uh, conspiracy theories and uh, COVID-19 in the Balkans. And this is really an, an exclusive because uh, they haven't been presented yet. So hopefully they will give some interesting uh, food for thought uh, for the discussion later. Uh, so on to the first uh, the first component. So, as I said, um, this issue of uh, of econo of the economic dimension of uh, geopolitics was uh, initially not discussed so much in this new uh, in this new discussion about uh, the Balkans and external actors, uh, because over the past decade and especially since uh, 2014 onwards, so after the invasion of Crimea, we had very much this uh, new Cold War dimension. This uh, uh, um, idea of uh, a clash of uh, almost civilizations that again was playing out uh, in the soft underbelly of uh, of Europe, which is uh, which is the Balkans. So those were this is where most of the headlines were uh, were focused on. But later on, it has gained much more traction, and uh, thanks to to some scholars and also some think tankers, and chiefly also to a think tank in uh, uh, in the states called the SIPE, but the Center for International Private Enterprise. Uh, we had uh, uh, gradually this uh, concept of corrosive capital developing and being uh, much more present in discussions. Uh, I do think this is a very important lens of analysis uh, and I'm going to speak very briefly about it. So corrosive capital is uh, broadly defined as uh, flows of money, so investments or loan, uh, that uh, exploit governance weaknesses in the host countries and make them wider. Um, examples in the Balkans are, for instance, Macedonia's highway that was recently, recently in a very good um, uh, <clears throat> report by the Institute for Democracy, uh, Societas Civilis uh, Skopje, uh, that shows how the uh, tendering procedures were bypassed, how uh, basically um, the, uh, the, the, the deal was completely non-transparent and agreed directly with the Chinese investors. Uh, a similar um, specular almost uh, type of investment uh, can be found in Montenegro, so Montenegro's highway that was discussed very much uh, in relation to the debt trap that uh, the government Montenegro might be finding itself in due to uh, this big um, uh, debt that it has uh, uh, contracted with the Chinese investors for this uh, for this investment. Um, in Serbia, there are many examples. Uh, I, I might mention um, those that relate to, to energy and also the heavy manufacturing industry, which also raises another huge uh, issue that is not discussed enough, I would say, which is the impact on the environment of uh, investments that are uh, very non-transparent and uh, kind of uh, uh, dealt in back to uh, deals, uh, pushed through with the uh, lex specialis, so with special laws that basically bypass normal procedures. Etc. So this very complex and very real issue, um, I've treated in uh, several of my works, and uh, uh, especially with my colleague from the London School of Economics, uh, Will Bartlett, we uh, did uh, some work on the United Arab Emirates investments in in the Balkans, and we also uh, elaborated on the political cultures that underpinned those deals. Um, and basically, we showed how um, a very top-down type of political culture. Uh, in in the host countries as well as in so in the recipient states as well as in the investor states is really what uh, underpins many 
of these corrosive uh, relationships that end up giving uh, a uh, fertile ground to these kind of uh, corrosive capital. Uh, so we identified that for the United Arab Emirates in uh, Serbia and Montenegro, although uh, there are there are other countries that have been touched by, by this uh, external actor too. But this, for instance, could also work for Turkey, um, or where uh, there is uh, other, you know, very good research that identifies it as a neo-patrimonial country now and you know in uh, in scholarly analysis basically sultanism is an extreme form of neo-patrimonialism which means that the um the the, uh, the boundaries between what is public and what is private are extremely blurred and uh, and therefore you have this uh, dynamic by which uh, uh, the basically what is uh, the public resources become also private resources and are conducive to these kind of uh, uh, backdoor deals and these kind of corrosive uh, investments. And of course, uh, the deals that I just mentioned above, so uh, Macedonia Skyway was uh, started during the Gruevsky regime in North Macedonia, uh, Montenegro Skyway during, you know, Milo Djukanovic's uh, uh, party's rule in uh, Montenegro, uh, the very many um, controversial deals in Serbia happened within this, uh, uh, this wider um, really atmosphere of a state capture by now we can say it because uh, uh, we've seen how what a, what what a really significant backsliding of democracy has happened in in that country uh, so basically we put this in relation you see this backsliding of democracy in the western balkans has provided indeed fertile ground to this kind of interaction and importantly Whereas Western investments are not completely exempt to such dynamics because it is more a uh, demand side issue from the host countries than a supply side, side issue. So basically the ground that you set as a country is what you get in terms of investments. So no investments are exempt from these kind of dynamics. Of course, uh, countries uh, that are more, you know, that are characterized by more authoritarian type of regimes are those that are going to be more at risk of uh, establishing these uh, these uh, type of uh, relationships. And that is why, you know, speaking about non-Western actors in the Balkans in this economic respect is indeed relevant because uh, there is there is a further um, risk of, of these type of, uh, of dynamics happening. So second component is the narrative one, how it gets exploited for domestic ends. Um, so basically, it's interesting to see that whereas still um, Western investments, and especially from EU countries, are much bigger, much more uh, present uh, in the Western Balkans than investments from non-Western countries, it is very often that those uh, investments coming from uh, Russia, China, the UAE, etc., are much more highlighted by the political actors in the media, in the way that they present it to the population. So this is an element that I noticed uh, for for uh, the UAE and my work in the UAE, because really like the way they were presented at the beginning of uh, Alexander Vucic's ascent in Serbian politics was really like the saviors of uh, uh, the Serbian nation, um, uh, allowing Serbia to get out of a very difficult economic situation uh, that was dragging itself after the economic crisis of 2008-2009. And I have traced this in a recent report for the Prague Security Studies Institute in media coverage and showed basically how this, uh, um, uh, this uh, framing of our brothers, our saviors that was uh, given to the UAE in those years has kind of been transferred onto China in this more recent years. And you could have seen that very clearly at play during the COVID-19 crisis at the beginning of uh, the COVID-19 crisis in the spring, when uh, uh, President Vucic um, greeted the coronavirus related uh, help from China by kissing the Chinese flag, uh, calling uh, um, uh, President Xi as uh, our brother and, uh, and telling the Chinese are our saviors. Although, you know, at the end of the day, we saw again that the EU gave much more help than what came from China, et cetera, et cetera. But this narrative is important. Uh, this narrative of basically friends coming to the rescue through the conduit 
of the local players. So basically the local players are, you know, those who ensure the stability, the ontological security of the nation, but using their friends who are coming to the rescue. And this I find very ironic, uh, very clever, but very ironic because basically, as we saw from the first component, the economic component, you use, you know, these deals uh, to at the end of the day, enrich your own elites, because of course, if they're non-transparent, if you don't know what's going on, then there are very, uh, there are very real risks of, uh, uh, of um, rent-seeking practices going to, uh, to buttress the, the, the political elites uh, in power. And at the same time, you present these same deals to the population as those that are going to save you. Yeah, so it is it is a, a game that is a very yeah shrewd uh, and of course helped by the grip on uh, on the media that especially in the case of Serbia is very present, um, but but it is a very ironic one and, and a very very uh, I would say worrying one as well. So on to the the third component uh, that I call the pandemic component. Uh, basically, we did a very interesting survey for the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group that was carried out by Ipsos uh, in all six Western Balkan countries in October, um, so two two months ago, not even. Um, and uh, uh, we we examined a lot of issues. An interesting one that I would like to highlight today is the one related to conspiracy theories and COVID nineteen in the Balkans. So conspiracy theories are more present in the Balkans than in uh, in Western countries. Uh, we can discuss why, why is that. There are uh, you know several reasons why why that might be happening. But interestingly, education, age, urban ur rural divide, gender, none of these uh, seem to be uh, real drivers of uh, um, uh, con conspiracy theories being widespread. Whereas something that we noticed in the data as actually being connected with it might be this kind of geopolitical divide, these geopolitical narratives. So interestingly, respondents from Serbia were those uh, with the lowest recorded belief in those conspiracy theories that are related to China's explicit design of, uh, you know, creating uh, the coronavirus crisis or of the Wuhan lab escape theory. So in Serbia, respondents from Serbia were those that had these conspiracy theories related to China at the lowest. And same actually goes for uh, for Serb populations in Kosovo and in Montenegro that related to the rest of the populations had it lower. So this you can put in relation with what I told you earlier about the framing of President Vucic uh, um, in, in relation to, to the Chinese brothers. Yeah, so uh, it seems that his message uh, might have re resonated. Um, another interesting geopolitical divide is that uh, those who favor uh, EU integration are slightly uh, less, uh, well, actually are quite less uh, uh, prone to, to conspiracy theories, a difference of almost 12% between Eurosceptics and Europhiles. And then something that I find the most interesting is that we figured out that there is a difference between the beliefs held by the majority and minority ethnic, ethnic groups in each country. So, although uh, Serbian citizens in Kosovo hold more favorable views than, than their Albanian compatriots uh, about the China-related theories, the other theories that relate to the US or to the pharmaceutical industry being behind the spread of coronavirus are very, very, very present. Uh, as many as 93.7% of this group of people uh, think in this pharmaceutical industry theory and 86% of uh, Kosovo Serbs think that Bill Gates was behind uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis. So this is, is very significant. And in a similar way, minority ethnic groups in Montenegro and North Macedonia are also kind of more likely to believe in conspiracy theories than the majority groups. So what, what does that mean? It doesn't for sure mean that minority groups are kind of, uh, I don't know, less intelligent or anything than the others, because also, as we saw, education is not a panacea against conspiracy theories. It is not uh, related uh, at all with it. It means rather, uh, in my reading, that uh, uh, minorities that feel disenfranchised by their government and are more distrustful of authority might feel more drawn towards seeking plots perpetrated against them and also feel more prone towards uh, uh, perhaps, you know, looking at their kin state or at some big power 
uh, being there and, and kind of helping you. So I think that this gives us some interesting food for thought in investigating this dynamics of trust building between authorities and, and citizens uh, more widely. So uh, I will conclude here and just uh, saying that while I do not wish to downplay the significance of the geopolitical dynamics in the Balkans, because it is absolutely present and one actor that is for sure gaining a lot of ground is going to you know, be present uh, even, even more in the future, not only economically, but also politically, I reckon, is China for sure. Um, I do think that uh, that we need to go beyond this uh, geopolitical chess pool, uh, chessboard paradigm because there is much more to it. There are so many other nuances that uh, that we need to see clear uh, into to understand the real um, uh, state of affairs uh, on the ground. And I hope we will discuss them later in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Matea. Back to you.